Chris, Eric, thanks for uh, joining me out here today as the uh, inaugural kickoff of the show this weekend, Sages NBT. So thanks very much for that. Mm -hmm. And what does NBT stand for? So NBT stands for Next Big Thing. Chris, can you talk sure, about I'm that, yeah. the history of that? Yeah, in a nutshell, the history is that um, about four years ago, Sages held a leadership retreat where we said, how can we make sure that we continue to maintain our position as being on the leading edge of technology? Because when you think about how Sages really grew in popularity based on its support of advancing therapeutic laparoscopy, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and the myriad of applications that have grown since then. But um, as Sages has matured and grown and become far more responsible and developed incredible education programs and guidelines and you name it, all of the ways that Sages has shepherded in these advanced technologies, we wanted to make sure that we were also still viewed as being right on the cutting edge. So we held a leadership retreat, which we called the next big thing. And the goal of that retreat was to say, so what is the next big thing? What's going to be the next laparoscopic cholecystectomy or whatever? And the conclusion of that retreat was the next big thing is the next big thing. And by that, we mean the process of actually always trying to stay on the cutting edge of technology and always trying to be that society and group of committed surgeons who are embracing these new technologies and welcoming them into the marketplace and trying to make sure that that technology becomes available to our patients. And that led to this partnership, uh, Eric, right, with SDTS, yep. and then Sages have partnered up on this. So, Eric? Yeah, so the Surgical Disruptive Technology Summit, or SDTS, we this will be our eighth year of doing it, and we were doing it independently of Sages for many, many years. I ran it through my local university at the University of Texas, and and created the infrastructure to get it going. And so we've been doing it year over year. Um, through miracles, we were able to get it done every year, even through COVID, um, and actually have a live meeting. It was kind of crazy that we were able to pull that off. Um, but uh, about three years ago, um, I was invited to NBT with Sages and, and as, as a speaker, and we started having conversations. And one of the things that came up is, like, we really need a, a, a meeting that engages industry. and. So I raised my hand and told Chris, I think we have that. If you want to start partnering, maybe that's something we could look into. And lo and behold, we started doing it. So all through the pandemic, we were doing it combined with uh, Sages. And so um, SDTS was, uh, uh, the idea was to be really engaging with industry and make sure that industry had a voice, not just a place to come and listen, but a voice to come and talk. And uh, we try to balance that with a content board that's made up of both industry, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and uh, providers, surgeons, gastroenterologists, uh, therapeutic um, interventionalists, and, and, and they help drive the content. We try to get this balance between what the practitioners would like to see and what industry would like to see and really get an engagement around conversations. And so that's how I got going. Uh, MBT liked the, the concept of it. Sages liked the concept of it. So we've been partnering together for the last three years. This will be our third year of doing it. And uh, it's, it's working pretty well. I mean, um, uh, Sages has uh, um, uh, a long history of engaging in minimally invasive surgery and endoscopic techniques. But as Chris just said, they wanted to make sure that they were reaching out towards the future. And, and they felt this was one vehicle to, to be able to do that. So um, our partnership's gone pretty well. And uh, we've been able to pull it off uh, every year. Um, sometimes we've had to delay it or reschedule it, but now we're back on full schedule. And one of the things that we're doing is we're engaging some of the things that Sages intended to do around innovation with this meeting chronologically, such as Shark Tank. And Chris, maybe you can talk about that. So, Tell me about the Shark Tank. So um, as a part of our trying to um, be seen as still being relevant and trying to really capture the very cutting edge of innovation. We said we need to create some kind of a method of engaging startups and, and the really like leading edge uh, innovation. So we created our own Shark Tank competition. And so we're now inviting um, you know, novel startups with new technologies, predominantly GI surgery related technologies, but not exclusively. And uh, so we have a competition every year that begins usually in the fall it has, it's a multi-round competition that's initially vetted by uh, a group of trained reviewers. Then we have our semifinals at this NBT Innovation Weekend, and we do it as a part of Eric's SDTS Symposium, which will be tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow I afternoon. believe. Yep. So tomorrow afternoon, for example, we have nine semifinalists who will be presenting really remarkable innovations. And uh, from those, we will select three or four 
who will then present at the Shark Tank finals in Montreal. In, in a couple of weeks? In, in, no, in, at the end of March. At the end of March, yeah. Well, almost a couple of weeks, we're February already, right? Yeah, so, so yeah. eight weeks, yeah. By the time this gets out. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that's always interesting, Eric, is we have the providers, uh, the entrepreneurs uh, with SDTS in a you know non-proctored, if you will, open environment to have these discussions about what's working, what's not working. And you and I uh, and Chris beforehand were chatting before we sat down and we talked about balancing that out in regards to do we want to hear more from the clinicians? Do we want to hear more from the creators? What's, what's the gap in the industry? Well, it's interesting. It seems to evolve, or at least my perspective of it certainly seems to evolve. I mean, one of the reasons I wanted the meeting is I felt that industry was often, at, at large society meetings, industry's often brought to the table and say, you know, help us support the meeting. Um, and you, yes, you can have your industry booths and you can have discussions around your industry booths, but not really bringing them to the podium. And so they felt like they weren't completely engaged. I think there are industries that, that still struggle being comfortable with that. But over the last eight years, we've gotten industry much more comfortable of getting up on stage and actually talking about their opinions. Um, and that, that's where we were pushing is to pro provide, have a, a, provide a format where industry really felt like they could stand up, ask a hard question, have a solid discussion about, about concepts and, and push against uh, the practitioners a little bit and get us educated about the whole process of innovation as it relates to you know, the business side of it and how hard it is to do and all the engineering that's involved and you know, market analysis and all those processes. And so as that's evolved, what we've seen is that industry was very welcoming of that, but it's interesting over the last couple of years, especially this year, I was getting a lot of feedback from industry. It's like, we would like to hear the surgeons more now. So I think it's a constant moving target. They want to hear more from us about what we think can be approved um, around uh, technology and innovation. So what we're going to do this year is a, a, a big session called My Favorites. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a bunch of practitioners up there with moderation from both the surgeons, practitioners, and um, industry. They're going to moderate it together, but we're going to have you know a whole bunch of this is my favorite, this device or that device, like liver retractor, stapler, vessel sealing device, hemostatic agent, things like that. And then we're going to try to dive into why people have these biases. What is your bias and why? It's a very biased discussion. Everyone just says, look, I'm very biased. This is what I love. I like this. It works well for me. And then everyone kind of criticizes everyone else's biases. We learn something, hopefully. Maybe we find some gaps that don't exist, and maybe that's something that industry can then go and look at and say, you know, they, they said, you know, this, this, and this. Maybe there's something there we could go and build or create or partner with and, and, and get something new out there that we're missing. And so we're going to try that format. It's going to be all Saturday morning. I'm really excited to see how it unfolds. Um, it's a little bit of an experiment, but that's kind of what this meeting's all about is, is experimenting and trying to figure out ways to engage industry and the practitioners, the providers in ways where um, you know we're learning something and we're driving something new. And that's one of the things that I applaud Sages and SDTS is a lot of these meetings have the tendency, I've been in this industry for 32 years and been to all the shows every year. And they tend to become ossified and, uh, and I'm gonna say it, good old boy club mm -hmm. and the people who put them on usually don't want to because they're either in a camp with a specific OEM or they just want to have that podium time for themselves. But I love the fact that we're allowing that opening within the, the, the Sages community and the surgeons and having the organizations there to listen, really, what's going on in an unbiased environment. So we're, while we're on technology, Chris, I want to have a question for you. We've seen this rush over the last couple of years, let's call it five to seven years, of the real digital push. So first we had robotics, who I think really made its mark in soft tissue. Let's, let's call it what it is. And it's you know the 800 pound gorilla, um, Intuitive, which is really a digital native major med device company, the only digital native one. Medtronic's not, j and is not digital native, but they are. And digital's really come in to the hands of the surgeon and the workflow and the clinicians. But we've watched it take a pause a little bit and an evaluation, not stop, but certainly the inertia, the uptake I don't know if it was from COVID uh, that sort of accelerated some of that or investment money, but what are your thoughts on the pace of digital up until the last year or two and then moving forward? So I'm gonna push back on the 
suggestion that there's been a pause in that because I think we need to separate out where we're going with robotic surgery and soft tissue robotics and where we're going with digital surgery in general. And I'm a big believer, every time I give a talk about the future of surgery, I always talk about how uh, you can always improve patient care by putting a computer between the caregiver and the patient. So you think about all the ways that we have advanced digital surgery by just putting a microchip between us and the patient. So yes, robotics is going through an evolution phase right now, and this is, you know, the evolutionists used to call this saltations, you know, things that slow down for a while and then accelerate rapidly, right? So I think we're probably seeing that in robotics right now. But what I'm really excited about that goes along with this is the evolution we're seeing now in imaging technologies and visualization. And, you know, for years, all we ever saw with, um, you know, the enhancement in, uh, in the visualization in surgery was we went from one chip cameras and then, oh, you got a three chip camera, you could lord it over your colleagues because I got a three chip camera now. And then we went to high definition and then we went to 4K and we dabbled in 3D and so on. But now we're finally starting to crack into this whole world where we can have mediated reality and use the advanced computer technology to um, manipulate the image that the surgeon sees. You pair that with uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and robotics and uh, there's enormous potential for for how we can augment what the surgeon is doing in the operating room so we might be in a little bit of a evolutionary phase in actual hands-on you know mechatronics robotics but I think that that we are still continuing to exponentially grow in terms of digital surgery and where that's going what do, the, what do the OEMs get right and what do they need to be cognizant of when they're putting a digitally driven solution in between the patient and the clinician slash work team? Yeah. So, Don't, well, you go ahead. So I, I think um, to pretty much support what, what Chris said um, with just maybe a little bit of nuance, extra nuance there, is that, that, that I think um, the, the the opportunities and the potential is immense. I, I totally agree. But you've got to you've got to wean it down and drill it down to a specific value proposition. Because if you get too distracted in the grand scheme and the grand idea of we're going to make things better, and you don't develop specific propositions, specific value, you know, added propositions and products around that, then it just kind of you know, you know just kind of dribbles in there without any real production. And so I think one of the challenges we're going through right now is everyone has great ideas, but they're trying to figure out how to turn it into products that are true value proposition. And some of these things are, you start having to get deep in the weeds and, um, and you start to realize uh, we've got to really show something positive that's easy to use. And one of the challenges is, is uh, it, it can sound great as a concept, it can even work to some degree, but if it messes with our workflow too much, then um, it's not gonna get adopted. And so as these imaging platforms come on, sometimes, here's a brief example, sometimes they're associated with another box or another thing. So is that more capital equipment? Do we have to add on a different camera with the camera we already have? Um, how does all that work? And so those are some of the challenges these companies are now facing is tr figuring out how to integrate into the platforms and you know, you have the big, the big uh, providers that already have major platforms indoctrinated into the hospital systems, healthcare systems, Intuitive is now one of them. And so how do you partner with them or how do you drive them to want to engage with your technology forward? And I think that's where they're really seeing a lot of challenges right now. The, the ideas are great. I think the actual products exist that are, are, are really getting good. Um, but now you've got to figure out how to integrate it um, in, a, in a workflow where the surgeon's like, yeah, that's cool, and that could help in this way, this way, and this way, but if it's gonna take me 30 minutes to get it set up and use it, then um, I'm not gonna use it. So uh, those are some of the real challenges, I think, that are, that are kind of percolating up as we've looked at digital solutions, and that's something we've had Friday mornings in this meeting for several years now, um, but uh, we're really trying to push both industry and the practitioners to say, okay, what's real? What, what, are, what are really gonna happen in the next year or two that could help? Let me add two thoughts to that, because I think Eric just hit that nail right on the head, but I think it's really important. So, first of all, we can have a big lofty goal about how the future of surgery is gonna be all computer assisted and AI and everything else, but we're not gonna get there if we don't have small wins along the way, and we all live in a market economy and you know the way capitalism works. We're not gonna to get to that big picture if we can't sell the little steps along the way. So for sure, exactly what Eric just said about making sure that we have innovation step by step that are marketable. 
The second thing is the whole issue that you address with your question, which is workflow. And again, Eric just mentioned that, but you know, you want to have something, an innovation that is going to be successful in the market. There's got to be a true clinical need for that innovation. The innovation has got to address that clinical need, and it's got to have a minimal impact on workflow. Because if it's going to take us a long time to set up that technology in the OR, who's going to want to use that? So this is a great opportunity mm. this weekend to actually you know, debate that and discuss that. And, and that's why I think our industry partners want to hear more from us, because they can come up with these brilliant innovations, but they need to figure out where's that friction point on the clutch where it, it's, it's too much workflow interruption in order for us to adopt that technology. You had used an analogy uh, earlier, we were chatting before we came on, uh, and I happen to know at least two or three major soft tissue robotic platforms, one that's commercial, two that are underway, that have these chock full of features that they're set to be turned on, but they're not turning them on yet, in part because of the FDA, also in part because your analogy of the iPhone. Uh, which was a brilliant analogy, so simple, but share that with our viewers. Yeah, so like, um, if you look at the phone companies, including Apple and all the big ones, uh, they, could, they could advance the technology more rapidly than we could really tolerate. I mean, um, if, you, if you make things change too much too quickly, um, you, you lose people because it alters their work so flow, workflow so much that they're like, I don't know how to use this. And they don't want to re-educate themselves on how to use their phone. They want the phone to, to through, an, through an edutainment type process, basically, get them uh, more advanced, but they don't want it to be a major step. Um, we, we need little incremental, to use Chris's term, incremental wins to get them there. So, you know, uh, I think uh, people who are developing robot platforms now, companies that are getting into that, they're realizing we need a true value proposition that differentiates us in the market, but at the same time, it can't be so different from what's already out there uh, that people are going to freak out and say, that's too different, I don't want to learn that. Mm -hmm. And there are people, there are always people like me and a few others of us that are out there, they're like, we'll dive in and we'll put the time in, we're going to learn that technology. You've always got those kind of early adopters, but they're not the market. They can help, they can help grow the market, but they also are known to be early adopters. And, and when I talk about certain things, I, all the time people are in the the back of the room saying, well, yeah, that's Wilson because he likes that kind of stuff. Is that actually going to work in ROR, right? And so you've got to, you've got to, if you're going to really grow the market, you've got to segment it in a way where you add on little improvements, although you may have mapped out a, a long pathway of substantial improvement, but you've got to do it incrementally. Hmm. Or people get, people get turned off. They get turned off, yeah. right, right. They're just going to come in, a majority of them are just coming in, they want to do their work, they want to give great care, they want to have great outcomes but don't ask me to go a little too far in order to push that technology forward. As, as you look at the landscape moving forward over the next couple of years, what are you keeping your eyes open, for, open and hoping for that gets traction? And then what are we not thinking about on the digital front, uh, especially in this minimum invasive, sagest world that we're in? So we'll start with you, Chris. So um, I think the important thing, there's a few th important things to understand. One is, the the there's so much to cover there's so much material to cover right now so our nbt innovation weekend is of course we have the gem of sdts i mean that is really the primary focus but we also have our collaborative meeting with the asge going on uh, this afternoon actually so the no scar meeting and to make sure that we stay in touch with our therapeutic endoscopy colleagues um, sages is also having a uh, symposium uh, or um, retreat, if you will, with our uh, surgical data science group who are actually going to be uh, spending some time trying to write a white paper on data ownership. And that's one of the issues that we're tackling right now is as we move into this world of artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, the new gold rush is data. Who owns that data? Where are we going to get that data from? And how are we going to develop that? And so uh, that's, that's probably one of the most important areas that we need to tackle going forward. And we need to continue working on this industry collaboration because there's a synergy between the two. We can't be independent of industry. Industry needs us, we need them. And for all of our efforts at our main meeting to have continuing medical education and all these education tracks that are, um, you know, by necessity have to be seen free of conflict of interest, we also need to have conflict of interest sessions where people can get up and talk about where the market is going and address all of the, the, the clear and concise points that Eric has brought up. 
And Eric, what are you hoping gets more traction and what do you think that is not being addressed right now? Well, so my overarching, and I've always been known to say that, you know, I, I think I'm pretty good at predicting the future. I'm just terrible at the timelines. And so my overarching, my overarching goal is, is a continued, and it kind of plays into what we're talking about with NOSCAR. NOSCAR is a, a group that got set up around endoluminal surgery, okay? And I really think endoluminal surgery is a, is a big future of minimally invasive surgery. And combined endoscopic, laparoscopic, and endoluminal flexible endoscopic procedures are, I think, a big, big game changer for the future of what we do in the gastrointestinal space and the abdominal space and, and things like that. So operating from inside the lumen and then inside the belly at the same time. And so platforms that are going to drive that um, ultimately, whether they're pure endoluminal or combined endoluminal laparoscopic and ultimately digitized with a bunch of extra information that we can utilize and can guide us, that is the overarching goal for me, I think, as it relates to, to surgery. All this digital stuff that, that can be analyzed off of that will be helpful. But just a platform where we sit in one, one location and we control endoluminally and laparoscopically um, all, the, all the instruments we need to control, um, I think that's the big, the big game changer that we'll be seeing hopefully over the next five to ten years. But it's a lot, it's a heavy lift to get there, and um, it's, it, it disrupts the market. Uh, and so, how people get there, and which companies do it, and how they do it—that's what I'm really interested in. I think every other company that's followed Intuitive into the soft tissue robotic market is realizing and has realized that this is really, really hard to do well. And they, they, the bar's a lot higher than it used to be. So expectations are higher. Um, so I'm real excited to be partnered with, with those industry folks and with our other surgeon colleagues around driving that mission. Um, and I don't know how long it's gonna take, but uh, I do think we're gonna see over time more higher, uh, higher task functions being focused on by us and our brains and lower task functions and simpler functions being controlled by computers and being controlled where you have more folks, more different points of access and digital analysis around all of that to make us more consistently better. I think as we try to drive consistency with innovation, we also have to leave room for creativity. And I think those are some of the things that will come into play as some of these uh, new digital analysis tools come on and they start saying this is the way to do something. Well, we need to make sure it's a way to do something that's very safe, but it doesn't stifle that front leading innovator that wants to be more creative and try to find even a better way to do something. So. And then final question for both of you. Um, Eric, I'll start with you. The med tech industry is really driven by the top three or four large strategics out there, right? Especially uh, in the end in the, of in the industry that we're in. Uh, we're talking about you know, J&J, Medtronic, Intuitive, maybe even you know, CMR coming in eventually to the US, certainly OUS. Um, is the digital push forward and the surgical robotic independent of form factor moving forward in soft tissue, can it be led by the small underweight punching above their weight financially and market ownership, can, can those small players who are all about innovation actually get it over the finish line with the amount of money that's required, the technologies they have to displace? Is there a fighting chance there? Well, I think it's any, it's like any big argument. If, if the big companies um, refuse, and, and it's really hard to, to, to turn a large ship, so if they if they they get caught up in their own market and they refuse to pivot, there's space for the small for the small players to get there. And I think there's enough incremental space that there is plenty of room for small players to build something that is truly game changing and and moves the moves the needle. Um, but the big companies are going to have to pay attention to that. And I hope that the big companies don't buy it just to kill it. That's, that's one of the other big things is I hope they buy it to integrate it and adopt it. And we're starting to see some of our startups that we've worked with for years, you know, Apollo, Standard Bariatrics, for example, two of them, big major acquisitions this year. Mm -hmm. um, both of those companies, Apollo got bought by Boston Scientific. Boston Scientific's now coming into the bariatric space, not something they've really been into. They're going to be more into the surgical space. They deal with surgeons, but now they're going to be in a lot more with surgeons. Um, 
uh, standard bariatrics got by Teleflex. Teleflex has never, you know, flexed into the bariatric space, big soft tissue space. So um, how is that going to change as, as they acquire some of these, you know, game-changing uh, devices and technologies? Um, how are they going to adopt it? I, I'm real curious to see how that unfolds. Your thoughts on that, Chris? I think Eric's right, but I, I would say very strongly with all apologies to the big players in this, the truly disruptive innovation is going to come from the smaller startups. The big players are, are focused on sustaining technology. They've got, they got a, lot of, uh, a lot of stake in the game, right? But the disruptive technology is going to come from the smaller companies. And they're going to have to make sure that they bring technologies to market that we can adopt, that we can use, that's going to be successful, um, you know, one step at a time. So that's where it's got to come from. And I'm, I'm, I'll, my, my forecast on that is I think the large players need to protect their beachheads, their multi-billion dollar beachheads that are non-robotic and non-digital in nature, like good old school analog work, which is really what makes the world go round. But I'm going to forecast that you're going to start to see, like Google had very early, an off-balance sheet, totally spin off another company, and just exclusively a brand new thought process, a brand new leadership brand new mantra of digitally and built here, independent outside the four walls. I think that's what's going to happen. So, so to be completely self-serving for what we're working on, I mean, I think the, the startups, and, and Chris, you know, he, he made a really strong point about this, but, but I think the startups, they need to be really listening and doing a lot of research and engaging with, with the, the people that are doing the procedures early. And I'm not saying they're not doing it at all, but these types of formats, I mean, if you're a startup company, you need to be in a place like this and you need to be hearing what our pressure points are and our challenges are. And the more research you do, the more likely you're going to be on track to get to something that actually has a value proposition. And there are people that truly care about innovation that are doing surgical work. And, uh, and you've got to find them though, because there'll they'll be people that act like they care and they really don't. But the people that truly do care, they're going to give you honest information. They're going to help guide you. And I think some of the startups that, that, that really get lost are, are just not listening to the right people. Um, big companies have that problem too. They, they have their own echo chambers. And, and, but environments like this where it's more um, balanced uh, and more open, where people can give honest opinions, that's what we need so people can, can not get caught up in their own little environments and, and, and not really hear what they need to hear. Mm -hmm. There's a self-bias there because yeah. you know you fall in love with a technology, nobody wants to say your baby's ugly, yet you've got all the clinicians out there saying, I'm never going to be able to hop on one foot, spin a plate to make that thing happen. And that's what happens with a lot of these technologies. You can have a great idea. You can be convinced that you've found the solution to all the world's problems, but if there's not a market for your technology, it's never going to fly. And that's why meetings like this one are so important because we can, so much conversation takes place in the hall outside the main auditorium. People sit down, have coffee with each other and, and, and you have these coffee conversations. But, you know, this is where you're going to find out whether your idea has any hope of taking, taking hold in the market. We need a place where we can have lots of disagreement. You know, if we're not having lots of disagreement, then um, it's not a balanced environment. So hopefully over the next two days, we're going to be in a very polite way disagreeing a lot. That's what I hope for. No, I completely disagree with you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. We're off to a good start. That sets the pace. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm Joe Mullings from Sages, SDTS, the next big thing. Be well. <laughs>